Hello, this is Evan Rogerson, and I'm Motor Gang here, and today I'm going to go ahead and break down the Vex IQ game Mix and Match, which dropped yesterday. Um, I'm going to go through the manual and break down all the important things there, and I'm also going to go through the game reveal video and break down that kind of things. Um, this is my first time really making Vex IQ videos. Um, last year was like the first year that I even remotely started to get involved with IQ. So let me know if you want to see more content like this, and be sure to like, comment, subscribe down below in order to please the YouTube algorithm. And let's go ahead and get into it. So, starting off, and as with usual, I can't play the music or else it'll get copyright strike. It's your standard 6 foot by 8 foot layout, um, with, except now one of the interesting things is, is we have two teams, uh, red and blue. Um, which I do think it's interesting for Vex IQ having different roles. Like, this alliance is more akin to one role, and this team is going to be better at doing one other role. Um, like, fundamentally doing the same things. Like, it's not like you're going to be building your robots for different things, but just objective-wise... I do think that's interesting, and I think that's cool, and it's going to lead to lots of cool, like, cooperation and teamwork things. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of cool. Um, initially, when I first saw this, I was kind of hoping that there would be some sort of thing in which, like, maybe the two teams can get different scores. Um, like, if there are a lot more red objects scored than the blue objects scored, maybe the red team should get a few more points. But it doesn't look like they decided to go down that route, um, which I think could have been interesting just to make the game less partner-dependent while still encouraging teamwork. Um, so, again, you're stacking things, and you're trying to put these in these goals. And there's two main kinds of object, pins and beams which closely resemble the standoffs and connectors for the Vex IQ um, parts, actually. So it's like a scaled-up version of Vex IQ parts, which is kind of cool. Um, and I believe, I can't remember if the rules have changed in recent years, but these parts will actually be legal next year. And of course, that depends on whatever the next year's manual says. Um, and then we get pins starting on posts. So it's interesting that we have um, the field layout here, as you can see the Red Alliance has more of the red objects in their side of the field, blue obviously has more of the blue objects in their side of the field, and they have their match load zones. So it definitely positions the robots in a way in which they're going to be wanting to do more stuff on their side of the field. Um, which, again, I guess it does make it a bit more dependent on your partner. And if your partner can't do anything, you are kind of screwed, but there are still at least a few objects that you can get. And the beams can definitely help out with that, I think, which there's only two of. Um, and then you have standard match loads, which I think is something they're going to include as a staple for VexU going forward, uh, just to try and keep more people involved on the drive team is something that they've talked about in the past. So I think that's good. Um, it lets more kids get involved. And at the level of Vex IQ, um, I think that'll just be nice. It doesn't seem as involved as this year, though. Um, you just have, I think, six preloads per team. So each person can only introduce six preloads. Um, also, if objects get thrown out of the field on accident, they get reintroduced as preloads. But again, not going to be a whole lot this year, which... I like max loads being not a huge part of the gameplay, but still present. Um, so then basically, robots drive around, and clearing your stake gets you some points too. So even just by performing easy tasks like removing pins from the stake, um, that can get you some points, which should be good for robots that can't necessarily stack. It does seem to have a slightly higher barrier for entry than some of the other previous games. And then as soon as you combine two objects together, these are now worth points. Um, and it doesn't like scale exponentially or something. So, like, there's no difference between doing, like, two two stacks and one four stack um, in and of itself. Except for when you go to placing goals, in which case I do think it will be better to do um, smaller stacks, as you can get more of the goal bonuses. And then the main thing here, the gimmick, I guess you could say, is you want to get multicolors on different stacks. So it's kind of like the opposite of, like, Tower Takeover as a game. Um, so you get a five-point bonus if you have two colors present, all the way up to 15 if you have three colors present. So it's really important that you collaborate with your um, partner, because um, if you look back at the starting layout, yeah, you can see right here, you start over here. Um, if you don't collaborate with your partner, yeah, you could, like, if I'm red, I could maybe grab the blue one right there, and maybe that one, and that one. Um, but you're really going to want to collaborate with your partner because they have six of the match loads. Um, so you're definitely going to want to be coordinating about, like, hey, I'm going to put all my red ones on the yellow ones, and then probably swap with your partner partway through the match to go and put red ones on the ones they've already put blue ones on. Um, and yeah, if you, you all have one color, that's bad, and you don't get extra points. Now, the stacks are just they're worth points anywhere on the field, but now you want to move these to goals in order to get extra points, and you want to move them to the goals that correspond with um, the color. So we have multiple goal, two goals of each color, um, just kind of go back there so two red goals um two yellow goals two blue goals and if we go through here you can see right here in rule sc5 um we have our limits for what can be placed in each side so we can get 
four on this floor goal in the middle right there. Um, so it looks like one, two, three, four spots. Um, we can fit three in the triangle goal. So three inside there, three inside there, and then just one inside the square goal and one on top of that standoff goal. Although with the connectors, you can definitely get more stakes. Um, and they match up. So you're going to want some that have red on the bottom, some that have yellow on the bottom, and some on the blue on the bottom. And then you want to go ahead and put these in the goals. Uh, some of these, like the corner goals, the square ones, they look pretty easy to score on. It's just a small little ramp. Although it is worth noting that if a game object falls over, um, it does not count for any points. Yeah, you can see right there in that paragraph. So you don't want to accidentally tip these over uh, going over that ledge. And then some of them I think will be a little bit harder. Like getting over the barrier into the triangle goal is definitely probably more challenging than just getting it into the corner like you can see over there the floor goals are obviously going to be the easiest and then the top standoff is probably going to be the hardest although it does have the part going up which might be useful for alignment and just making sure that they don't accidentally tip over once you're up there um, i haven't really interacted with the field at all so I'm not sure quite how that'll work and again you get an extra 10 point bonus um, if you put the red one in the red goal and same for all the other ones so lots of 10 point bonuses here and now you can just have the stacks, and you can also add beams, which beams kind of function as a multicolored thing. It's like a wild card. It fits whatever you need, which I think is really cool, um, because even if your partner isn't the best scoring robot, you can still take advantage of... Obviously, you're not going to do insanely well, but you never would anyways. Um, you can still use these beams, like if I'm red and my blue partner really isn't getting their match loads in, um, I can go ahead and take advantage of these red of these beams to go and act as the blue ones. Um, so you can kind of... Whoever's the stronger partner can kind of take advantage of the beams and fill them for the other team's weakness, kind of. So I think that's also kind of cool. Um, and yeah, they're a wild card, so they'll be whatever you need. And then they also allow you to build these sort of like tree-like structures. Um, or I guess like opposite trees, depending on how you go. Because um, you can see down in this picture right here, um, beams, the way that they function is you can put three things in each of the holes. There's one, two, three. Um... And you can get structures like this, in which you have three pegs all going in here, and just you can kind of stack them up, um, which is especially valuable for the center standoff goal, which I'll get to in a little bit. So yeah, you can make these stacks, and then you still would want to get that, because that has a blue bottom into one of the blue goals in the corner in order to get the extra bonus. Yep, so, and then it gets the same points as like being in a matched goal. And now you can see the floor zone here. Um, where you're wanting to put the yellow inside of there. The red one doesn't really need to be there. And then you can go higher by going off of the standoff goal, which gets bonus, extra bonus points um, for having multiple stacks up there. So you want to almost make like one of these T-structures. That way now you have three different stacks going on. Um, and the beam does look like it counts for multiple times, um, because if you look in here at the scoring options, you can see the connector beam only counts for one point, or ten points once. Um, but the stack being connected to the beam counts for 10 points three different times. So it's basically like 20 points um, for having the stack connected to it, and then you get an extra 10 for each additional stack connected to it. So the connectors are definitely worth a ton of points. Um, just by having like these stacks all on their own, you'd be missing out on all of these points. And also, instead of being three colored stacks, they would only be two colored stacks. So these are extremely powerful game pieces, and there's only two of them. So you're going to want to use them wisely to maximize as much scoring as possible. Um, and then even better, you're going to want to put this on top of the standoff goal. Um, so you get just a 10-point bonus for the standoff goal for every stack. So you, even just putting one thing up there will get you 10 points, which is just going to be the same as the floor goal. But if you use the standoffs, it can get multiplied even more times. Um, so you're going to want to put like a standoff structure up there and get multiple stacks. And that's kind of the different ways to play. You still have your teamwork challenge. Uh, you have your skills challenge. Um programming skills, whatever. Um, I do think the game is kind of cool. Um, it definitely seems to have a lot more strategy and focus, because you can't just, like, even if you can just stack them all really high in one big stack, that's not going to be worth a lot of points. It's more like, just get one of each color on it and then put it in the corner. Seems to be the most effective and quick strategy to do it. And you want to prioritize the number of stacks. Um, because, like, the color bonus and putting it in the goal is, like, that's 25 points, whereas just scoring the three objects is just three points. Um, so it's definitely more about playing smart and being strategic and making sure that you're adding the objects in the right spot on the field and you build them up correctly with a good order. Um, and there's a couple things important in the game manual that they didn't quite mention in the reveal video. 
Um, so as you can see, there's 10 blue pins, 10 red pins, and then 16 orange pins. Um, so you do have more orange pins uh, than you do other pins. So those would probably, at the end of the season, if you're trying to max out the score, these are probably what you're going to go for. But early season, probably not, not best not to use these, as mainly you're just going to want to be focusing on getting one of each color in the stack. That should be your first priority. Um, then we have the goals. We still have the minute-long uh, matches. Uh, minute long skills, minute long programming. Um, same standard setup of like, hey, if it's score affecting, it's a DQ. This is just a new chart, hasn't actually changed any of the information. We have our goals here. Um, we have the floor goals, the standoff goal, triangle goal, and square goal. They all function the same other than the color being different. Um, there's your match load bar, so you have to place your match loads touching this. Um, a few other things for scoring that they didn't mention in the game reveal video. Each cleared starting pin, so by clearing your starting pin, you can get yourself an extra two points. And then by contacting a scoring objects at the end of the match, you can also get two points, um, which is just going to be something for the weaker teams just to be able to quickly get a couple of points at the end of the match. Um, also might be useful to contact the yellow pins. As, like I said before, you're probably going to have extra yellow pins lying around just because there's more of them, and that could be a nice quick way to score a couple points at the end of the match. However, it's worth... Noting, this might not be the best strategy, especially at higher levels, because when you're touching the game objects, they don't actually count as scored. Um, so the standard stuff about you have to wait for the match to end, and then the head referee will go and score it. And then scoring objects must be connected to other scoring objects. Um, do you get another connection to the floor, standoff goal, or beams? And you have to nest them inside of each other for them to count for points. They have to be upright, which there isn't a super clear definition for about what counts as being upright. I'm sure this will be clarified in the Q&A later on in the season, though. Um, which actually, speaking of like Q&A and timings and stuff, um, we do have the release schedule, which looks fairly similar to last year's. Um, these are updating on Thursdays, and there is now a one-week grace period. So you don't have to worry about some update coming out that would majorly change your strategy. Affecting the tournament that weekend, you'll at least have one more week of preparations. And then, like I said, the Q&A, that opens on May 27th. So I'm sure, like, upright, what classifies as that will be one of the first things that gets asked. So it's based on the number of colors for scoring, uh, criteria to be placed in the goal. You need to at least still have two objects. You cannot be touching the objects placed in the goal for them to count. And then you have to be completely inside of it. Um, you cannot be exceeding the maximum amount. Um... And then, of course, you want to make sure that it's matching the goal so the bottom color pin is the same as the floor. Um... And again, starting pin being cleared is relevant for the extra two-point bonus that it gives you. And then here's the extra rule they didn't mention. Robots will receive two points at the end of the match if they're contacting scoring objects. However, you have to be touching at least two objects or touching a scoring object that is nested within another scoring object. So basically, either touching an object that was already scored, but now you de-scored it, but it still counts for points. Um, in the this form of ending a match or you just touch two objects that aren't scored which seems like the better one because then you're not taking away points from yourself and as you can see there's just some oops just some scoring examples here um, this is all pretty typical stuff um, a couple ones like you can see tipped over very bad um, because now you get zero points um, there are a couple ones that were a little bit confusing yeah you can see this with this beam not being scored here um, it actually negates the other ones, um, which doesn't quite make sense because I would have thought that like those would have still counted as two stacks on their own, um, but I guess not because it's part of all three stacks. None of the scoring objects would qualify as connected. So very, very important. Do not touch beams at the end of the match as you can like something like this um, that originally would have been worth like 91 points goes all the way down to two points. Um, so very, very important where you end the match because you could definitely end up in scenarios in which you negate an entire big stack and lose a ton of points right at the end of the match. Uh, safety rules are the same as usual, as well as the general game rules. Um, and then let's move on to some of the specific game rules like expansion. Um, the starting size this year is 11 inches by 20 inches by 15 inches, which I believe is fairly standard for most years. Um, and then you have to start basically touching the triangle goal and touching your preload. Um, and that's basically it. There's a couple other things like must be stationary except for your pneumatic pump, but those are pretty self-explanatory. Um, don't intentionally throw objects out of the field. If they do, they can get reintroduced as max loads. Horizontal expansion, um, you just can't expand beyond your starting size at all, which I wish that VRC could get something this simple. 
um, because right now the VRC rules are a complete mess with horizontal expansions. So just don't expand horizontally at all, and then you can expand vertically as much as you want. Um, so nice simple expansion rules there. And then you get your preload, which starts contacting your robot and does not already contact Scourge. Um, and for using the loading zones, you must put it touching the loading zone. Um, can't be touching other objects. You cannot be touching the robot while the human's still touching the object. And then once it's released, you can't go back and do it. Um, and then if you do imp introduce it improperly, then you get to take it out and put it back in. Um, and keep some distance away. That way you don't accidentally like accidentally hit your robot and touch it, as this could be score-affecting violation, um, which could get you disqualified. So just be careful about that. And that kind of covers all the main rules for robots um, and tournament play. Those all looked pretty similar. Um, and then moving on to skills. And this is just Appendix A, which is if you want to look like the dimensions for any of the objects on the field, this is where you would go. Um, and then there's a simplified appendix. Did I miss skills? Here we go. Yeah. Um, skill setup is like this. So kind of chaotic in how everything is laid out. Not at all symmetrical. Um, standard rules apply if they're not explicitly overridden here. Um, and then you just normal scoring rules for how you score, except there's you have access to both the red and the blue objects. Um, and you must start touching the triangle goal, and you can use the red load zone to load any color of pins. So max loads are still relevant for skills. Um, but again, this is kind of a crazy field layout, so I'm not sure what the best paths through here are going to be, but I'm sure teams will have plenty of time to optimize those throughout the season. There are a couple differences into how you load. Um, so again, you don't use like the blue loader, for example, um, and try not to have objects lead the field. Um, but they will still be able to be reintroduced as max loads. And then, as per usual, if your autonomous goes completely haywire, you are allowed a small amount of contact with your robot. Um, and, yeah, that's kind of it for uh, the skills rules. They still have stop time as per usual. Um, overall, I think it's a pretty cool game. It definitely seems like one of the more complicated games that they've had this year. Um, I mean, in past years, just in terms of strategy. Um, and the GDC does have their note of things they'll probably change. Game piece layout is something you expect to change, which isn't something that usually changes. Um, but I'm guessing that's more just to make it a little bit harder for scoring. Um, then the field max loading. Um, it's still relatively new to Vex IQ, so the GDC might change it to be more strict um, if teams are having issues with the rules. And then beams and goals, because there isn't quite a loader like there was for VexIQ last year. Um, for VRC, there have been areas like this, and they've kind of been a mess in years like Tipping Point, if you go back and look at those. And then beams and goals. Because um, like they said, there's no reason to like make these super tall stacks um, once you're past a certain point. So if teams start to get maximizing, um, like the scores are getting maxed, they might add some extra point values there just to encourage teams to do the more challenging things. Um, but that's kind of it for the Vex IQ game. Let me know down in your thoughts on it down below. And don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and I will see you in the next one.